Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. Welcome to another session of our series on paradise. And we're almost at the end of uh, discussing uh, what happens in paradise. And I want to remind everyone the reason, you know, every prophet that Allah sent came with the same message. What does that mean? That means they all taught the same thing. They all taught to believe in Allah and to obey them as a messenger. They all taught about belief in, in paradise, belief in hell, belief in the Qadr of Allah. They all taught about the angels. They all taught about the books. They all taught the same thing. They had the same message. The only difference between the prophets were, were their rules, their fickle regulations, their guidelines were different. For example, uh, a lot of things that uh, uh, Allah made unlawful for the Jews were not because they were bad. It was, it was, it was a punishment because the Jews, uh, they kept rejecting Allah and his messengers over and over and over again. And then the Christians, when they became the chosen people, they did the same thing. They began to pick and choose what parts of the religion to accept and and all of that too so Allah made things unlawful for them as a punishment but with us when the Allah sent the prophet Muhammad when we say that he perfected the mission of the other prophets what does that mean that means that uh he made everything Allah revealed to him everything lawful is good and clean and everything haram is bad and dirty so the punishments that were for the people before us were lifted. For example, the Jews were punished and told they could not eat shellfish as a punishment, not because crab or shrimp is bad. You guys know crab and shrimp is good, okay? But Allah punished the Jews because they kept disobeying him by saying, I tell you what, I'm gonna teach you a lesson. You ain't gonna eat, you can't eat crab no more. You know, the same with the Christians. He made things uh, uh, unlawful for them that way too. But when the prophet Muhammad became a prophet, he said everything good and clean is lawful. The only things that are unlawful are the things that are bad and dirty. So that's what how he completed the mission of all the other prophets that came uh, before him. But they all came with the same message. They all spoke about paradise. They all spoke about hell. They all spoke about the angels. They spoke about the Qadr of Allah. They even spoke about the signs of the last hour. But our prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went into more detail than any of them. He covered paradise and hell as you guys can see. Everything that I've taught you is taken directly from the authentic hadith. He taught us everything we need to know about paradise and hell. The things I taught you, these are the things that he that will keep us balanced. These are the things, you know, when you're tempted, you know, to do something haram, you think about that hellfire. It'll, if you believe in Allah, it'll make you not do it. OK, when you were going through depression or anxiety in life, like I was going through a few minutes ago, something upsets you in life. You get angry. You think about how if you control that anger and you remain patient, how Allah will reward you with the highest uh, gardens of paradise to pun Allah. And that'll make you cool down like I just cooled down. I said, I'll deal with it, Allah. I'll be patient. It's all worth it. The trials we go through in this life, they end up being worth it in the long run. And that's what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam emphasized to his companions, because remember, they were subjected to more trials and more tribulations, you know, than we are. OK, and uh, they handled it with, with patience. They handled it. They were resolute. They were strong. They didn't allow life to cause them to weaken in their belief. 
They didn't get angry at life to the point where they said, I'm going to take it out on a law and not pray or not do this or not teach my class. No, if I don't teach my class, I'm just hurting me, you know, because this is the deed that I do best that can earn the love of a law. So if I get angry, so well, I ain't going to teach today. Who am I hurting? I'm hurting myself. You know, and that's what the prophet wanted the companions to see. When we let, let shaitan make us angry, you know, we end up hurting ourselves. We can't hurt a law. We can't hurt no one else. It's ourselves that we hurt. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's why he was so detailed about paradise and hell. So when we are faced with the challenges of life, we can handle them with dignity, handle them with reserve, and keep it moving. All right, yesterday we spoke about uh, the people of paradise. We spoke about the wives of the people of paradise. And I did put a quiz together. I know I didn't post it up to the last minute, but I hope some of you were able to look at that quiz and see it. Uh, uh, let me see if I can, if I, I think I left it on my screen, yes. Simple questions. Let's look at the first question here. Yesterday we spoke about a marketplace. We spoke about how there is a marketplace of paradise. What is this marketplace and what happens there? Who can remember? Who can answer that? What is this marketplace in paradise and what happens there? Can anyone here uh, get hands up? Let me see the participants. No one can remember. Okay, go ahead, Sister Shamza. Um, this marketplace is where... Um... It's every Friday where people will go and gather um, and also do some shopping. Mainly will be the men's, but the women can go as well. And then um, oh, uh, during during that time, also a wind will blow and then will become more beautiful every time. Okay, good job. It's a marketplace like here. And it's a, the people will gather. It's a place where the people will gather to talk and meet and do things like a, it's like a mall here like things we do here okay it's like a big mall okay and uh it's every friday and like she said the wind will blow on the faces of the people and beautify them even more you know, Allah knows his creation because he created us. We like to meet. We like to gather. We like to go shopping. We like to catch up on the news. So that's what this marketplace is. You know, we can gather and meet and catch up on the happenings or the latest fashions from fast track fashion. That's what I'd be interested in. Hey, anybody heard? When's Pasha going to invite us over for dinner today? That's what I want to hear. When is Pasha having her uh, showing? She's going to, I heard she got, uh, had a law grow for her three special tuba trees. I, I can see me now. Anybody know when Pasha is having her gathering so we can see the latest fashion from off those tuba trees that she had a law grow specifically for her? You know, subhanAllah, it's a, like a mall, a place we can go and get the news, get the happenings and meet with each other. Hey, Fresno, what's going on? I heard you had 50 children. Girl, you know you pretending to be young. I'm going to tell y'all the truth. You know how old I mean Fresno is? She ain't no 33. In, in, in the earthly years, she's 2,568 years old. I can see me now, T's and Fresno. Girls, you know, you feel me. I can hear a friend's know. Girl, you better go into your garden and leave me alone. Yeah, by the way, I had 30 more children. You feel me? I mean, that's just what we'll do. We'll laugh and talk and meet with each other and, you know, in these in, in, at the marketplace and just catch up on the latest happenings and all that. And the good thing is the happenings are good. There's no bad, no pain, no suffering. You know, it's all good news. How many children did Fresno have? Hey, y'all heard, I heard a law grew a couple extra gardens for Brother Ammont. Uh-oh, I heard Brother Tarek was raised up even higher, to a higher level, because of the supplications that those thousand children him and Yasmin had made for him. I mean, you will just catch up on the good news like that, you know. Did y'all hear about Anissa? 
she got two chocolate trees with licorice and gumdrops on them. Now, I didn't know a law would give us that. Well, I guess I'll go ask a law to give me a tree with a uh, noun laters on it. You know, that type of news, you know, the happenings and stuff like that at this marketplace. Okay, let's look at question number two. Will the people of paradise remember their lives here in this world? Who can answer that? Will the people of paradise remember their lives in this world? Go ahead, Zarina. And what will yes, they remember? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Give us some examples of what they'll remember. Um, they'll remember the challenges um, and the, the fearing a law. They'll remember that they fear a law and that they only depended on the law. Um, it only called called on the law, and um, they will allow will remove any injury, any kind of sadness or hurt from their heart. But um, they will reflect on that and how merciful Allah has been to them for letting them into Jenna. Exactly. Yes, uh, we'll remember our lives here. We'll remember the hard times as well as the good times. But when we think about the bad times, we'll say we'll be so thankful. Oh Lord, remember when I went through that? Remember when I had that knee surgery? Oh my God, I thought it was the worst pain ever. Alhamdulillah, no more pain in paradise. We don't have to worry about having bad knees in paradise. So we'll think like that. When we think about the bad things that happen to us in this world, all they will do is, is magnify the happiness and the bliss, you know, that we have of finding a law's promise to us to be true. You know, so yes, we'll remember those good, you know, those good things and those bad things, Supana Allah. You know, but the more we remember our lives in this world, they will magnify and intensify our love for Allah because we will see that it was all worth it. You know, this life is worth it for the believer, the trials. We had a sister ask about dying as a martyr yesterday. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, asking a lot of killed, have you be die, die as a martyr? I told her the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us to make dua asking Allah for a good ending, however and whatever it may be. Because to be a true martyr, how do you think they get that position? They met horrific deaths. They didn't have a good, no, no, no nice dying in a sleep. You know, a martyr ain't dying in his sleep. It's painful. It's gory. I wouldn't wish for that. I just wish for a good ending. Like the prophet said, pray for a good ending, however it will be, because Allah will give you that based on what you can handle. Okay. And, uh, you know, subhanAllah, Allah, you know, for those people who really did die as martyrs, look at Umar, look at Uthman, look at those companions and the deaths they, look at Amir el As, he died of old age, but look at the deaths that many of those uh, Azubair, look at how those companions met their end. Could you handle that type of uh, mutilation? Abdul Rahman, the son of Abu Bakr. Oh my God, did y'all know how he died? The story, maybe Mukhtar do y'all his story for y'all. Abdul Rahman, the son of Abu Bakr, you know, he went he after he met with his mother. This is during when the Muslims were fighting against each other. He went to visit uh, uh, visit uh, his aunt, his aunt Asma, who I mean his sister Asma, okay. And uh, and then and 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 like she told him, you know, what did he fear? He said, I don't fear dying. I just feared them mutilating my body. I, you know, cause that's what they would do. These men would be killed on the battlefield and their opponents, even the, the, the hypocrites were their opponents. They were fighting. Their opponents didn't just kill them with the sword. They cut their head off, cut their hands off, their private parts. They would mutilate them as a means of trying to humiliate them in death. Okay. And I remember, you know, he before he went out there to fight, he said, I don't fear dying. I just don't want to be mutilated. And she had to remind him, does a sheep, does the sheep feel the pain when we slaughter it, when it's dead? Get on out there and fight. Okay, and that's how he lost his life, mutilated. I mean, I, no, I wouldn't ask for a law for a death that's uh, for, like that. You know, I would just say, like the prophet said, pray for a good ending, however it may be for you. 
You know, Supana Allah, Supana Allah. We have to understand, guys, this life is meant to be a trial for us. Everything that we endure in this life is hard, but it's all worth it in the long run if you make it across that bridge. That's why the prophet, he knew how Uthman would meet his death. That's why he told Uthman, he said, you will be the third person to enter paradise after me, but you will meet a horrific death, a horrific death, a horrific death. And then he told the other people, whoever stands and supports him, you all are in the right. Those of you who stand against him will be in wrong. So he uh, had that premonition from a law and he let Uthman know. Uthman knew he was going to meet a horrific death. And that's why when what happened him happened, he was calm. He was patient. He said, oh, you know what? I had a dream. He had a dream that night. The prophet came to him and told him, you will be with me. You will be breaking your fast with me and Umar and Abu Bakr. So when those people came in and killed him, he, he took it like a man. He tried to fight them off because he wasn't no wimp, you know, but he knew he was going to die. You know, but he knew what was what was expected. And look how strong his faith was. He could handle a death like that. He's stronger in mind than any of you or me. Subhanallah. So, you know, a loss, the prophet said, pray for a good ending. Don't pray for certain deaths. I mean, oh my God. He said, pray, ask Allah to give you a good ending, a good ending that is good. And also one that you, you know, that is hand that can be handled by you. Umar, he could, he, he used to wish to die as a martyr. He could do that because he was the strong in his iman. He wished to die the death of a martyr. But Umar was a warrior even before Islam. Even before Islam, that was their, the pagan Arabs, they all wanted to die with their sword in their hands. I mean, they could handle that. But can you Muslim today handle the type of deaths these men and women met? No, you ain't strong in your mind enough. Pray for a good ending. Everybody understand that? Ask Allah to give us a good ending, however it may be. Okay, so yes, the people of paradise will remember their lives here. They will remember the challenges they had in this world. They re will remember the, the challenges they met in this world, but those challenges will cause them to have even a greater love for Allah and be even more appreciative of paradise. What about um, the hard times? The hard times, will the people remember the people who hurt them in this world? Can anybody ask, answer that? Will the people of paradise remember those people who caused them pain in this world? That's what I mean by this question. Will the people of paradise remember those people who caused them pain in this world? And if so, how? Go ahead, Sister Jamila. Uh, yes, they will remember those that hurt them or did evil to them and so forth in this world. Yes. Um, and what will they do as a result? Anything more about the, the people that hurt us? What else we talked about? Yeah. And what else happens to if those people? Not only we will we remember the people that, well, hurt, that hurt us, but what else? Will they be laughing at them? Yeah, Is there yeah. remember that talk about they in hellfire? Yeah. They, they will be talking about those that are in hellfire that- Will we just um, talk about them? Will, be able, will, we, will we be able to see those people that hurt us? Yes. Yeah, and what we gonna them. do when we see them? <laughs> Laugh and talk about them? Yeah, that they and hurt that's what- and and I, and look up Exactly. You know, do you guys know I got a couple of emails here last day about that? So that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna get, it's like, I'm always having to show my dolly even though I show it anyway. People need to start reading my PowerPoints because I always put my evidence. I received a couple of emails, some, some more nice high givers, you know, telling me, oh, Sister Layla, you said that the people of paradise will make fun of the people in hell. God is great. God is good. Eat your beans like you should. Our Lord 
said we can't make fun of people. Our Lord said we turn the other cheek. That that weak, ignorant is stuff y'all have in y'all's mind about Islam. Well, today that's what I'm, I'm going to give you so much evidence. It's going to make your head sink in as to not only will we remember the people that hurt us, not only will we laugh at them, we're going to pick them out of hell and point them out to everybody. I'm going to give you so much, Dalil, you're going to sit there and, and swallow your tongue. And you guys need to learn the deen. How can you advise someone about Islam if you don't understand it yourself? Dudes, I understand my religion. I don't know how to cook. Everybody here that comes and hangs out in this Zoom room know Layla Nasheba cannot cook. I try. I go on YouTube, make recipes, and then they never, don't, none of them come out right. I always do, I don't know. I can't cook. Don't ask me to sew no clothes. Why do you think I get all my beautiful Pashimas and stuff from uh, Jamila Pasha, Fast Track Fashions? I couldn't sew. I tried it several times. I even went to sewing school. Can't sew. Can't cook. Don't ask me about birthing no babies either, because I don't do that either. But one thing I can do, and one thing I do know how to do well, I know my religion. I know this religion because I was raised up on it. It was drilled into me from the time I was, from before puberty to way after. So I know my dean. I'm not going to sit up in here and tell you guys stuff about this religion that is not true. So today for these not see hat givers or seekers, you know, I'm going to give you so much since you didn't read my Dalil yesterday. I'm going to give you so much Dalil, you're going to swallow your tongue. You might even want to cut it out. And you will realize that you need to get up off the internet. That's the problem with men today. Too many of you brothers are looking for an easy way out of your obligations. You young men, these are young men. You young men, you need to go get a job. You're in your 20s. You're in your 30s. And you don't want to work. You want to open up a YouTube channel. And you want to sit on YouTube and talk about Islam. Use the looks that Allah gave you. And smile and grin in the camera to a bunch of women. And by the way, the prophet said, that's why there'll be more women in hell because a woman will follow a wayward man to hell and back. All you got to do is flash your smile, trim your beard, and speak with an accent. And you done got all the women. Well, you brothers, you young men need to stop doing that because you ain't qualified to teach Islam. You need to get up off the YouTube channels. Go get a J-O-B. The time you're wasting on YouTube misrepresenting Islam and trying to attack people who do know Islam is time you could have spent going to school to get you something that can help you, you know, help you in this world to earn a good living for your family. Because that's how you get to paradise by taking care of your families, not sitting up on YouTube praying that you get a million followers so you can get a check from YouTube for two, $3,000 a month. Because that's what they be getting, guys, in case y'all don't know. All those people on YouTube with uh, trillions and millions of followers, and you look at them, Google them losers. They don't have a J-O-B. They get paid off of y'all. That's why they tell y'all what y'all want to hear. That's why they're not breaking down paradise like I am because they're telling you stuff that you want to hear. They're telling you women that you won't wear hijab. You're, they're telling you men, you won't have a beard. They're telling all of you that you don't have to pray or anything else, that you can run around in the garden of Eden naked because that's what you want to hear. And that's all they care about is get keeping those millions of followers so they don't have to get a job. So they can sit up, flash their smile and travel the world. Have you invite them to their mosques and they can marry two, three, four women. Let's just get real. Marry a woman, divorce or marry a woman, divorce or marry a woman from all over the world, divorce them and getting rich off of your, your paycheck because you're stupid enough to listen to them. Y'all better stop falling for that. And you young men, get up off your behinds and go get a job. Stop 
talking about Islam when you don't understand it. Because the first group of people who will be dragged by their faces and thrown in the hellfire on the day of judgment are those Muslim men and Muslim women who call themselves scholars or sheikh, sheikha. Allah is going to ask, what did you do with the knowledge I gave you? Oh, Allah, I taught the people. I was a dyer. I called them to your religion. Allah will say, you are a liar. You sat on the internet teaching this line because you wanted the people to call you sheikh. Think you were a sheikh. And then Allah will command the angels to grab the person, drag him by his face and throw him in hell. So think about that, you young men. Don't waste my time sending me emails about how you want to give nasiha. Give that nasiha to yourself. I know my religion. You don't. All right? Okay, so I'm telling y'all, be careful. Be careful of who you learn this religion from. I'm going to give you even more evidence today. And that's the problem. People don't read because that's why I video everything. My videos are on YouTube. I use PowerPoint, PowerPoint, so you can see the Dalil. So next time, read the Dalil. Stop and pause the, the, the video so you can see the Hadith. But I'll give you more today because I just gave you a taste yesterday. I'll give you the dessert today. As Khalid Yassin say, I'm going to give you the meat and potatoes today. Okay? All right. Okay, let's put this up. So, yes, uh, the people will remember the hard times in this world. And, yes, they will speak of them. And look at the people in hell who caused them the pain and suffering in this world and mock them and i'm gonna give y'all more proof okay yesterday we also spoke about how allah will grant so many wishes to the people of paradise what type of wishes are allowed in paradise can anyone answer that we talked about how the people go ahead latifa what kind of wishes would the people have in paradise go okay. ahead even though you have stuff you need, you can wish for things you want. Like if you want to have a baby, if you want to plant a flower or if you want to, you know, lounge around and sleep, if you want to. Uh, so basically that? all that can be put in one category. Teacher, your teacher, mm -hmm. categorize it for the people, you know, put it okay. in. Okay, It'll be things that you want to do or things that you yeah, just things enjoy you do doing. That are. Things Law. you enjoy doing that are, go ahead. Law. Yeah, exactly. Things that, that's why I like her answer. She's a teacher. Things that you enjoy doing that are lawful. And we have to specify that because we're living in the days of fitna. Like the one sister asked yesterday on Facebook, she said, well, if Allah will give us every wish we want, then what if a person wishes to smoke cigarettes? She said a lot of people enjoy smoking. And this was a good question. I'm sorry I didn't, yesterday I didn't look at Facebook because I didn't want to see the sister about the homosexuality. But uh, I missed that sister's question and this other sister's question. It was a good one. She said, what about if a person enjoys smoking cigarettes? A lot of people smoke cigarettes because they enjoy it. Well, people enjoy drinking alcohol. People enjoy shooting up cocaine. I mean, yeah, snorting cocaine. People enjoy, what's that new thing they're killing the kids with? Fentanyl. All those things are haram, but we enjoy them because, again, Allah said humans are attracted to the things that are bad and dirty. But before you enter paradise, your heart's going to be purified of that stuff. You will not enjoy or be even desiring anything that was bad or dirty for you. Do everybody understand that if something was bad or dirty in this world, and by the way, everything that Allah made haram is bad and dirty. Anything that was bad and dirty in this world, you're not going to want, you have no desire to do it. 
Remember, we talked about the dipping. The prophet said one dip in that hellfire will cause you to forget everything that you thought was good in this world that was really bad for you. You won't never think about cigarettes again. Cigarettes? Are you kidding? Alcohol to get drunk, get high, to party? Oh, no. We're not to party and orgies. All that stuff will be, you will never think any of that stuff is good. So again, we have to specify to the people today, since the Muslims today, so many of them are weak, you know, what type of wishes are allowed in paradise? Things that you enjoy doing that are lawful in this world. Okay, nothing, no cigarettes, no drugs, no sex out of wedlock, no pornography. Some people enjoy porno. Porno is bad and dirty. That's why it's haram. No porno in paradise. Does everybody understand that? So that's why I needed you guys, uh, Latifa, to specify that. Okay. Okay. Yes. The sister's on. Let me look at the Facebook. Exactly, sister. Right. Okay. She's asking again. Uh, so the, yes, only those things that are lawful, because remember, we talked about the hellfire, the dipping. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said some Allah will take some people and dip them in a hellfire for just a second. And then he'll take them out and ask them, do you still think something that I made haram in this world was good? And they'll say, oh, no, oh, no. She said, okay, yeah, so that's the hadith. Exactly. You guys have to remember these hadiths and put them all, keep them all in your heart and mind. So, yeah, so nobody's going to enter paradise desiring cigarettes or gambling. Exactly. No gambling. Good job. Okay, she's asking about playing cards. This stuff is lawful. It's lawful to play cards. It's haram to gamble. So yeah, if you want to sit around and play spades, I like to play spades. Subhanallah, say you want to play spades, you call up uh, four, uh, two, three other sisters and y'all sit there and play a spade or uh, a, a, a bid whist, that's lawful. Yeah, so you know, we'll have those type of wishes. And I want to play spades, Allah. Yes, as long as it's not haram. Spades is lawful, as long as you aren't gambling. Exactly. Yes, thank you. Yeah, she said, oh, now, now she understands. MashaAllah, see? Islam is not as hard as people make it out to be. Yeah, good job, sister. Okay, let's go to the next question. If a woman was married several times in this world, which husband will she be with? Who can answer that? Sister Mary Ann, if a woman was married several times in this world, which husband would she be with? Um, the last husband that she was married to, if she still is married to him. Good job. And where is you got any evidence? Because, you know, this is what they argue. That club, they arguing about this right now as we speak. Dr. Asim's in there with them, trying to tell them to come to Sunnah followers to learn from Layla. Give me some evidence. The last one she was with, if they remained married. You got any evidence? Um, yeah, Hudifa said to his wife, if you want to be my wife, my wife in paradise, do not remarry after I die. For the women in paradise um, will be with the last of their husbands on earth. Good job. Hudifa, one of their eminent companions, told his wife not to remarry after he dies. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the woman who does not remarry after her, because you know, most of those companions were martyred, who does not remarry after her husband's death will be with him in paradise. Were there other evidences too? That's all I need for the answer here. But anybody else with any other proofs? Go ahead, Tony. Um, when Um Darva, she was proposed to Moralia, 
but she re- she refused to marry him because she said she wanted to be with, she wanted to be with Abu Darda when when in paradise. So exactly. she didn't marry him at all. Exactly, Muawiyah, who was also one of the companions. You know, he wanted to marry Abu Darda. I mean, Um Um Darda, but she told him no. You know, because she wanted to be with Abu Darda in paradise, and he told her the same thing that the prophet said: if you don't remarry, you'll be with him. By the way, guys, just a little bit of information here. Muawiyah was a a good man, but he used to beat his wife too. <laughs> He's another one of those Arabic men that had a hard time understanding that you ain't supposed to beat upon your wife. He's also the one who the prophet was talking about when that sister came to him and said, oh, prophet of Allah, I got two proposals, one from Muawiyah and one from someone else. He said, well, the first, the, 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 the uh, uh, Muawiyah, he beats his wives. He got a problem. He's kind of heavy handed with his wives. So that was another thing with Muawiyah, just so you sisters know. This, uh, you know, the prophet tried to teach the companion to live with women in happiness and love because back in those days, just like today, the dark ages, they treated women so bad. All uh, men, the Vikings, the Romans, the Romans gave the women a little bit more power. The Persians, the Indians, the Egyptians, women were treated so bad back in those eras, that era. So the prophet Muhammad had to teach the men how to have good character and live with their wives and happiness. And Muawiyah was heavy handed. He was known for snapping, you know, snacking, smacking a woman around if she didn't do what he wanted her to do. And the prophet warned this one sister not to marry him. And that's also why when uh, Muawiyah became the caliph, uh, he wanted to marry uh, one of the, the, the daughters, granddaughters of um, Ibn Abbas, and she refused too. She said, oh, you heavy handed. She said, my grandfather told me that you used to walk with your stick on your back. She said, nope. Not marrying you. Yes. Any other Dalio, Sister Anab? I was trying to ask a question. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna ask, does it work um the same way for the woman too? Like if um if she dies, like if the man is married to her and she dies and if he remarries, like how does it work? Does it work a the same way? A man can have more than one wife, so they ain't in the same category with us. Okay. You can't have but one husband. You know that, right? Yeah. Don't you know that your husband can have four wives? Yeah. Don't you know that if your husband can marry you and then five seconds later marry another woman? Yeah. Don't you know that in paradise, a man will probably have a million wives? Yeah, you said that. So the same rules don't apply to us because we're monogamous. They're polygamous. A man can have more than one wife. You, he can be married to you. You drop dead. Okay, hum the love, make do, and move on. He can marry another woman, and another, and another. Yeah. So the, this is for you women. That's why the question is about a woman, not a man. A man can have many wives. But are, if you're if you're asking me if a man divorce, are it's the same question. Are you asking me if a man divorces you, will he be married to you in paradise? No, because obviously he Yeah, divorced. right, right, right. Yeah, so yeah, a man can have multiple wives. We can't. So this is for us women. If you want to be with your husband, that the husband that you have now, if you want to be with him in paradise, you shouldn't, uh, you don't divorce him. Out of all the men I was married to, there's only one man that I would want to be with in paradise. Unfortunately, we're divorced. He was my Moses here. Sorry, I guess I'll get the real Moses in paradise. But that's it. I mean, I'm just saying, if you lose out, this is why these men told their, their wives that. If you really, that's why the prophet's wives could not marry after him. Because once a woman marries another man and tastes the sweetness of him, that's it. So that's why Allah forbade the prophet's wives. If y'all want to be with him in paradise, y'all can't marry nobody here. And that's something that you sisters need to think about. That's why Abu Bakr told Asma. He said, Azubair is a righteous man. Azubair is one of the people that's promised paradise. He said, if you stay patient, 
you know, and, and don't divorce him, you know, and die married to him, y'all be together in paradise. But she ended up divorcing him because he was heavy handed too. He could be heavy headed. Back in them days, the dark ages were bad time for women in history. He had a stick on his back too. She ended up divorcing him because she couldn't put up with him. He was righteous in his deen, but not in the way he treated her, you know? But that's why Abu Bakr told her, think carefully. This man is one of the 10 that will be in paradise. If you want to be with him, you can't divorce him. If you divorce him, he's like, I can give you a divorce. But you ain't going to be with him. And that's what you sisters need to think about. You got a good, righteous man that you would love to be with in paradise. Don't divorce him. A lot of us marry several times. I've been married several times. One of them brothers, I would love to be with in paradise. He was my Moses. He is my Moses here. But unfortunately, we won't be together. Because we were divorced. So. I'll get the real Moses. It's okay. So anyway, good job on that answer. Let's see if Antar got it right. Antar says she will be with the last husband she was with. The prophet said that, yeah, exactly. Good job. That was one of Antar's questions. And mashallah, she understands it. What about this? If a woman died divorced in this world, Will she be with her ex-husband? What about that? Say, for example, my Moses in this world. Me and my Moses got divorced, unfortunately, thanks to the drama of the people. Will I be with my Moses in the hereafter? Go ahead, Shamsa. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot my mic was on. Um, Anybody else? If you don't know, she won't. Right. No, she won't be with the um, oh, husband that she got divorced with here. Instead, she Allah will have someone ready for her in paradise. Exactly. So that's what I'm saying. You sisters got to think twice before y'all decide on them divorces. And that's what Abu Bakr was telling his daughter. Because you can have a righteous man in this world, you know, and, be, and you know he's righteous and you want to be with him in the hereafter, you know. Once y'all separate, that's it. He ain't yours no more. All right? Think about that. All right. Last question. This is a big one. We spoke about the purification process that the women of paradise will go through. The purification process not only purifies the heart of the women from this world, but what else does it purify of the women from this world? Who can answer that? Anissa, do you want to answer that? Because yesterday I think you wanted to answer and we got cut off. Anissa? No, that's okay. I know the answer. Let the other girls do it. Oh, yeah, because you know the answer. Okay, yeah, anybody the else? If a woman, uh, the purification process not only purifies the heart of the women from this world, but what else? Let's see. I want somebody other than Marianne or Tony or Anab. Who else? Sister um, Adka, Sister Adka, do you know the answer? Sister Fartoon, do you know the answer? Sister Fatma, do you know the answer? Hawa, do you know the answer? Khadija, the purification process not only purifies the heart of the women of this world, but what else does it do for her? Go ahead, Isra. Let's see if Isra got it right. Isra, my Isra. I was gonna say her body too, meaning like we will be virgins. Mashallah. Um, inshallah. Give your dad because you're my best student. Go ahead. Yeah, we'll be Allah says that we'll be 30. The Prophet Sallallahu says that we'll be 33 and our hearts will be purified, purified. Um, so will our bodies, meaning we'll be um virgins as well. Not only not only the, the Hurun Aims, but also the woman in this world. Good job. Bodies and hearts purified. And just so you guys know, too, especially for my little Israel, remember, this is from Ibn Abbas's explanation, too. You know, Ibn Abbas out trumps anyone else. I don't care what these other people had to say. If Ibn Abbas speaks, you, the rest of the people go sit down. He was on the only original companion. 
And Ibn Abbas, and I believe Ibn Umar too, Ibn Abbas said this too. This is from him. This is from his top seer. I'm using Ibn Abbas's top seer. I ain't using no Ibn called Paul Fear or in them other ones. Even Katada don't out top Ibn Abbas. Even Katada does not out trump Ibn Abbas. You know, as Ibn Abbas said, the purification process also entails not only purifying the hearts of the people that enter, but their bodies too. There'll be no pubic hair. There'll be no more menses. Allah says in the Quran, that verse, remember this verse, Israel, that verse in the Quran where Allah says, the women of paradise are free of impurity, free of menses, free of postnatal, not postnatal drip. Well, that's true. We're free, free of postnatal drip too. And postnatal, you know, told you I don't know nothing about no babies, but we free from that too. And also that means you're you're fresh, you're new. As Ibn Abbas explained in his top seer, we're fresh, we're renewed. So we're virgin when we enter. You're virgin and heart, as Ibn Abbas said, you're virgin and heart and spirit, and you're virgin and body. You're a new person, you're taller than you were in this world. You're more beautiful, you're clean, you're, you're sweet, all of that. So we'll be virgins too. Good job, Amina Antar, she got that one too. Good job. So mashallah, uh, these are the things uh, that we spoke about yesterday. And I'm glad that you all remember, Sister Anab, good job. So good job, Sister Anab. Uh, good job always, Tony. and. Um, um, uh, Marianne, you guys are excellent. You guys are catching up there with Israel. Good job. Okay, so today what I'm going to do is speak a little bit more about the time that we will spend in paradise, the conversations we will hold, and I'm going to give more Dalil, more Dalil for the Nasiha. I'm going to call you a Nasiha seeker. Because Allah sent you to me so I can educate you, evidently. And why take you take a break off your YouTube channel and you can get educated. Okay, so let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. Okay, wait a minute, guys. We got a problem here. Okay, Facebook, they're saying, can you please? Log in and kick this woman out. What happened? I'm trying not to read that. You guys add me to these different groups on Facebook. Is that the lady that that thinks that because she's gay, she can have El Hurin? Okay, hold on, guys. Let me log in on my phone. Well, you know, on Facebook now, you can log in on your phone and, and pick people out. I learned that from Sister Pasha. She does it on her show every day, you know. Okay, hold on, I'm logging in on my phone. And just come in here and how do I kick her out, brother? Okay, hold on. Oh, it's easy to do. I can do it. I could have did this on my iPad too, right? Let me see. Let me click on Amina Antar's. Oh my God, did you know you can do this, Amina Antar, everybody? I can do it on my iPad. When you are on, if you're on your phone or your iPad and you're in, in a, doing a video like this, just click on the person's name. I'm going to show you. I might see if y'all can see her name. <laughs> click on the person's name and then you get like, comment, block. I mean, the Antar, I'm just showing. Block the person. It allows you to block. See, that's something new you learned. Okay, so if I block her, she won't be able to type in here her stuff anymore. Okay, the brothers tell me to block her, block her out. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh my God, that's easy. See, I learned something new from the people on Facebook every day. She's done. You know, we have to understand, guys, you know, people, we're living in the time, the days of fit ten that the prophet warned about, you know, this homosexuality. I have a series that I did on the signs of the last hour. And the prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said one of the signs of the last hour is that homosexuality, homosexuality will become 
widespread. And we have these gay Muslims, you know, and it's just pathetic. Yeah, that, I wasn't looking at the screen on there because I, I told you guys yesterday I'm ignoring her. But uh, now she's blocked. So inshallah, she won't be able to come in here no more, brother. Yeah, and you guys stop arguing with these people. Don't waste your time arguing with these ignorant people. Okay, because she's not going to change. Only a law can change the heart of man. And that woman is so messed up. She's so messed up. And that person's name that she's mentioned. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you about that person. You know, I, I tell you guys, you have to be careful who you take your knowledge of Islam from. Uh, in this group that they have me in, this private group on Facebook, they're talking about uh, this woman before we blocked her was speaking about a so-called scholar. This woman's name is Amina Wadud. I'm sure you guys have heard of her. Amina Wadud is a homosexual. She's a graduate from some university. She has a PhD in the Quran. She has a PhD in Islam. She has a PhD in Islamic studies, but she still does not know that Allah made Eve and not Steve. She still does not know that a woman cannot lead a man in prayer. And this shows how corrupt the Muslim lands have become. This woman has traveled to Egypt. And do you guys know that in Egypt, some parts of Egypt, they have women calling the Abdan for prayer. In some parts of Egypt, they have women leading the prayers. And this woman, Amina Wadud, introduced this garbage. She was one of the first women to do it here in America. I'm going to tell you, brothers, any man, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, any man who allows a woman to lead him in prayer, your prayer is not accepted because a woman can never be to never be a leader over a man in prayer. Also, Islam forbids women from calling the Abdan. Allah commands us in the Quran. He says, do not beautify your voices in the public, O oh, you women who believe. So to call the Abdan, you know, publicly, it requires beautifying your voice. So this woman who this sister was speaking about. Yeah, she's a scholar for dollar who will be a follower of Shaitan. You know, be, just because people have PhDs in Islam does not make them a scholar. El Furqan is a gift that only Allah gives. And Allah says in the Quran, he only gives El Furqan to a few people. You can't go to school and learn how to be a scholar. Allah is the one that gives understanding of this deen to you. And like I said, this woman has all those PhDs and she still don't know that Allah made Eve, not Steve. She still don't know that she can't lead a man in prayer and all the people that's following her. And that's what this woman is following. She said that uh, this Amina Wadu said homosexuality is permitted. I don't care what Amina Wadu said. Shaitan said it's permissible to. What did Allah say? You know, so don't waste your time arguing with these people, guys. Subhana Allah. Yeah, so yeah, but she's out there now. I won't put her, inshallah, she can't join. Thank you, brothers, for showing me how to uh, block on Facebook. Okay, are there any more questions before I start the lecture for today? Yes, a woman cannot call the Adhan publicly. In fact, guys, you sisters, I know some of you sisters, when you pray, you like to recite your prayers all loud so everybody can hear. No, we pray silently. You move your tongue if there's people around you. Allah says, do not beautify your voices in the presence of men because you don't know the evil that lurks in the heart of a man. 
So we women can't do that. When I pray, I pray in my bedroom. You will never hear me sing in the Quran. I pray and move my lips. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, move your lips when you remember Allah. So the only person that can hear me is myself or my cat, if my cat is sitting there. So yes, you sisters, you don't, and also there is no Adhan and there is no Ikamit for a woman. What does that mean? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, since calling the Adhan and since calling the Ikamit requires beautifying your voice, women don't have to call it. Did you sisters know that? You don't even have to call the Adhan or Ikamit before you pray. You can stand up and say, Allahu Akbar. And that's how your prayer begins. The prayer opens up with Allahu Akbar. A woman does not have to call the Adhan. She does not have to call the Ikamit at all because it requires beautifying your voice. And Allah does this to protect us. Your neighbors next door can hear you. He could be turned on to you. It could attract him. He could want to harm you. So see, Allah makes these rules, you know, for our betterment to protect us women in Islam. So yes, so there's a lot about the prayer that uh, you brothers and sisters need to learn, especially my new converts in this uh, Facebook room. I did do a series on the prayer and I'll talk about it again because a lot of you sisters need to learn these things. Yes, a woman cannot lead a man in prayer ever not even your son, okay? If your son knows Al-Fatiha, he can lead you, all right? And you do not call the Adhan publicly, nor do you call the Ikamat publicly for no masjid or any of that. Now, if it's just you sisters praying by yourselves and you want to call the uh, Adhan or Ikamat, that's fine, but calling it for a mosque, I don't care about Amina Wadud. Amina Wadud is a, is a person that will bite the dust unless she turns and changes her ways. She's one of the biggest innovators of our decade. Yeah, we don't follow her. She's nobody. She'll lead you right to the hellfire. Yeah, don't be duped by people. All right, any other questions about the prayer before I start the uh, lecture? You're welcome, sister. Yeah, just be careful of these people. Yeah, she's African-American, but I'm sorry. You don't be duped by that. Remember your allegiance as a Muslim. Our allegiance is to Allah, to the prophet, and to the believers, not to race. Just because you hear a woman call herself a scholar and she's African-American, I'm sorry, or she's white American, or she's Egyptian, or you don't pick people based on race. You pick people based on what they say. Do they back up what they say with Quran and, and, and Sunnah, not their race? Yeah, but I'm very much aware of Amina Wadu. She started a great innovation in America and she's over in Egypt doing it. Yeah, the government in Egypt is corrupt. Yeah, all right, you're welcome. Okay, let's put the PowerPoint for today. <laughs> we got off the to topic a little bit. <laughs> Okay, but I had to let the sisters know. All right, y'all got me in this political group. Okay, let's look at the PowerPoint because we're going to continue with our topic on hell and paradise. She said, oh, okay, you're welcome, sweetheart. Okay, this is hell and paradise session 43. When you go to YouTube to watch this, session 43, and what we're going to focus on is what we discussed yesterday, how the people of paradise will be able to look down. And by the way, this is one of the greatest parts of paradise, and I can see me doing this. For the people that know me, like Latifa and Fresno, Aisha and them, they know that Layla loves to mock people. I can see me doing this all day and night. The people of paradise will be able to look down, point out people from the hellfire and talk to them and mock them. I told you this guys yesterday and now I'm gonna give you more Dalil since we have the Nasiha men here. First of all, we talked about how the people of paradise will laugh at the people of hell. 
Allah tells us this, not Layla. I don't make this stuff up. Allah says that after he admits the people of paradise to paradise, they will call out to their opponents amongst the unbelievers in hell and they will reboot them and scold them. Where's my Dalio again? And I gave you this Dalio yesterday. Pay attention. Allah says, in the interpretation of the meaning, and the people of paradise will call out to the people of the hellfire saying, we have indeed found true what our Lord has promised us. Have you found true what your Lord promised you? And the people of hell will say yes. And then a crier, which is an angel, will proclaim between them the curse of Allah is on the polyist, poly, polytheists and the wrongdoers. And that's it. That's the Quran. So I don't make this stuff up. Allah says that. Allah says that. We'll be able to look down into the hellfire and we'll see them. Just like you can see me, we'll be able to look down in hell and see those people and their punishments. Oh yeah, we'll see it. And we'll be able to call those people out and ask them, hey, who got the last laugh now? And why shouldn't it be this way? This is poetic justice. Why shouldn't it be this way? These are the people that used to make fun of us. These are the people that used to insult us. These are the people that used to argue with us and tell us that we're terrorists, we're towel heads, we're criminals. Remember, this world is a test and a struggle for the true believer. It's a prison for the believer. But on the day of judgment, the believer will be victorious. We will have our grandstand then. We will have the last laugh then. Listen to what Allah says again in the interpretation of the meaning. And let me highlight it here. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Let me go back to it. Hold on. Hold on, I hit the wrong button. Okay, let me go back to it. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, verily the righteous who used to fear Allah and stay away from evil in this world, they will be in happiness in paradise, sitting on thrones and able to see all things. Now, Ibn Abbas explains that when Allah says able to see all things, Ibn Abbas says that means that the people of paradise will be able to see into the hellfire. There's my Dalil. When I told you guys you can see into the hellfire, there's the Dalil. Allah said it. And this verse is explained by Ibn, Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas knows this religion better than anybody you know. He explains it. Able to see all things. We're able to look down and see the hellfire. Also, Allah says, you will recognize their faces. In their faces, the people of paradise, you will recognize in their faces the brightness of happiness. They will be given to drink a drink of pure sealed wine, the last which will smell like musk. And for this, let all those in this world strive to attain. So we'll be sitting on thrones, guys, sipping wine, looking down at the people of hell. Can't you see me doing that, Latif? Y'all know I like to look down at people and make fun of them, people like that that's ignorant, okay? That wine will be mixed with tasneem. We talked about the way the spring of Tasneem. Verily, during the life of this world, those who committed crimes, this is a law speaking, not me. Those who used to commit crimes, those who committed crimes used to laugh at the people who believed. And when they would walk past them, they would wink at one another in mockery. And then they would go to their people making fun of them. Now, let me explain this. Allah sent this verse down because this is what happened in the, in the beginning of the prophet's mission. You know, when the, the, uh, the Arabs of Mecca began to convert to Islam, the Quraysh converted to Islam, they were punished and tortured. 
When the prophet Muhammad would go to the Hajj and stand there trying to call the people to Islam, Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab and them, the Quraysh, they would make fun of him. They would call him crazy. They would call him insane. And they would pretend to be listening to him. Then when he turned his back, they make faces. You know how people do. They would wink at each other, make faces like, oh, he's crazy. We ain't listening to him for real. So that's when Allah sent this verse down, giving the prophet Muhammad and his followers hope. They may make fun of you now and laugh at you now when you walk past them. But they won't be able to do this on the day of judgment because on the day of judgment, listen to what Allah says, on this day, those who believe will laugh at the unbelievers as they sit on high thrones, able to see all things. So there's my evidence. So I didn't, I'm not making up stuff. We will be able to look at the people of hell and make fun of them. It's poetic justice. We should be able to do that. They tormented us in this world. They called us terrorists. They called us flying nuns. They made fun of the way we dress. They said that we were the ones strange because we didn't run around without clothes on. They thought we were crazy because we didn't date. They called us gay because we didn't date and fornicate, because we didn't do drugs, we didn't do alcohol, we didn't go out to the strip clubs, the nightclubs. It's poetic justice, because we went through heck on this earth. We paid our dues. So it's poetic justice that we have the last laugh on the day of judgment. So how can you think that's bad? SubhanAllah. Also, Allah lets us know that the unbelievers will deserve this. They will finally have their punishment. The believer who is now in luxury will remember that colleague. He or she will remember that friend who used to encourage him to follow disbelief in this world who used to try to get him or her to take off the hijab, get him and her to deviate away from the truth. And we'll be able to sit on our thrones and pick those people out and say, look, that's the lady that tried to get me to take my hijab off. That's the man that called me gay because I didn't date. Listen to what Allah says. Where's my evidence in the interpretation of the meaning? They will look at each other. A speaker of them will say, verily, I used to have a friend in the world who used to say, are you amongst those who believe in resurrection after death, that when we die and become dust and bones, we'll be raised up again? And the man will say, look, will you look down? So they will look down and he will point out his friend in the fire. And he will say, by Allah, you, you nearly destroyed me. Had it not been for the mercy of Allah, I would be right there with you. So there's my evidence. And I gave you this evidence yesterday, guys. So I'm not making this stuff up. Allah is detailed. And the reason why Allah detailed this is because the companions were the ones experiencing this. This is why I tell you guys, you will never understand the Quran. You can read the Quran till your heart stops beating. You're never going to understand what Allah is saying until you learn the Hadiths. Because every word that was revealed was revealed because something happened. Something happened to make Allah say what he said. And what happened was the Quraysh were making so badly a fun of the prophet and his companions. They were persecuting them, teasing them, ridiculing them, slandering them. So Allah sent these verses down to give the prophet and his companions hope. That hope that they needed, your day is coming. And remember, many of these people were killed. They were killed by the Quraysh. So Allah said, don't worry, you'll have your grandstand. And it's encouragement for us today too. The Quran is for all times, even though we're not being persecuted here in America for practicing our religion, 
openly like that. Okay, still we're we're mocked, we're teased, we're ridiculed, we're discriminated against on our jobs, we're looked down upon by our neighbors. Homeland Security is knocking on our doors all the time. You know, we we can't even go to a grocery store without people whispering and winking their eyes. This gives us hope. When we read these wonderful verses of the Quran, you know, it gives us Muslims hope today too. Our day will come. Just be patient. Just be patient. Just be strong and be patient. Your day will come. So that's the Dalil for that. Also, now we get to the nitty gritty about the people of paradise not praying. Hello, take hint. The people of paradise will pray. The people of paradise will worship Allah. Why wouldn't they? Allah is giving them everything that they could desire. But the difference is the people of paradise will pray and worship Allah, not because they have to. They'll do it because they want to. Remember, guys, before you enter paradise, you will go through the purification process. We've talked, that's why I talked about hell first. Allah says no one will enter paradise unless their heart is in sync with what Allah likes and with what Allah hates. For those people in this world, I'm sorry, for you brothers and you sisters in this world who think that making salat is bad. That tells you right there that you're gonna have to do some time in hell because you cannot enter paradise believing that unless your good deeds are so good that it out tops that and Allah will give you that drink of water uh, that will take away that thought, okay? Because some people's good deeds can out top those bad feelings as long as you're doing your prayers, okay? But there's a lot of Muslims that don't pray because they think praying is an ob it's so tiring and, and it's bad and it gets on my nerves. These people got to do time in hell because praying is an obligation. If you ain't fulfilling that, you got to do some time. But for those who don't like to pray, but they do it because they're obedience to a law, they can maybe drink the water and still be of the right hand. If you wanna be of that right hand, guys, we got to struggle. Like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's all about changing the condition of yourself. We have to change ourselves and make our hearts conform to what is pleasing to a law. You got to stop looking at prayer as being something bad. And instead, make your soul view it for what it is, something good. Otherwise, you got to go through that dipping and that hell fire if you're one of them people that ain't doing the prayer. So the people of paradise will pray. They will worship Allah, not because it's an obligation, but because it's something that they want to do, something that they will enjoy doing. Remember, paradise is a place of reward. It's not the place of testing. Now, where's my Dalil? Where's my Dalil that the people of paradise will pray? Here it is, bam, in your face. Imam Bukhari tells us, can't get no better than that, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the people of paradise will glorify Allah morning and evening. That's what we'll spend most of our time doing, guys, is praying to Allah. And this worship is done out of enjoyment. The people of paradise will not view it as a hardship because they've been purified. Instead, they will see it as enjoyment. Why? because they have seen the face of Allah and they are benefiting from his pleasures. They have earned his love. So just like the angels, the angels glorify Allah night and day, so will we. We will do it out of love for Allah, our way of thanking him for all these wonderful things he's given us. Listen to what Ibn Taymiyyah said. He said, this worship, it's not the kind of obligatory work 
that is done for the sake of a reward. Instead, it is done because the people will enjoy it, the pleasure of it. He explained that hadith, just as Ibn Abbas has. Although Ibn Abbas outtops him, Ibn Umar outtops him too. They all say that all the companions, all the companions agree that the praying and worship that we do in paradise is out of enjoyment. Does everybody understand that? So when you guys are listening to these famous speakers on YouTube tell y'all things like this, y'all need to stop listening to them. They're not giving you their evidence. How can you tell the people, alhamdulillah, you ain't got to pray no more? For a man to say that, that means he hates praying. And if he hates praying, how can he be a scholar? How can he teach you about Islam when he's letting you know that he hates performing his obligations? If you hate performing the obligations in this world, something's wrong with you. This hadith is authentic. It's Sahih Bukhari. And there's other hadiths too, but I just gave you this because this is the copy. Subhanallah. Allah. And again, why will the people like to pray? We would like to pray because the greatest joy of all in paradise will be when Allah tells you that you have earned his love. When Allah tells you, guess what, Sister Sabrine? You will experience no more pain. You will experience no more suffering. You do not have to be tested no more. You have earned my love. You have earned my pleasure. When Allah tells us that, we will fall down in complete submission to him and we will glorify him. We will praise him because, oh my God, this life was so hard for us. Listen to what the prophet Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. He said, Allah will say to the people of paradise, O oh, people of paradise, and they will say, Yes, Allah, we are here at your worship. He will say, Are you happy? They will say, Why should we not be happy, O oh Allah, when you have given us what you have not given to anyone else? And then Allah will say, well, shall I not give you something better than this? They will say, oh Allah, what could be better than all of this? Allah will then say, I give you my pleasure. I will never, ever, ever be displeased with any of you. So honor Allah. That's what will encourage us to worship him more. Oh Allah, I don't have to, Prove no more. We spent all our lives in this world proving that we believe in Allah, guys. Why were you created? We were created to worship Allah. He put us here on this earth to prove to him that we believe in him. No more proving. Allah, when we enter through the gates of paradise and when those angels assign you to your garden and to your level, and you look in your garden and see all that. That's when Allah will make this announcement. Guess what? It's all yours. You don't have to prove yourself anymore. You earned my love. I know you believe in me. Live and be happy. Oh my God. Can you imagine this, guys? No more having to prove to him. So the people will bow. The people will submit out of happiness, out of desire. And we will spend most our time as we meet with each other. Oh, Amina, doesn't it feel good? Got to be tested no more. Girl, Allahu Akbar, Layallah, Hayallah, Allah. Let's make two rakats, Amina. Come on, the people will be out of enjoyment. We ain't got to be tested with our children no more. We ain't got to be tested with our parents anymore. We ain't got to be tested with our jobs anymore. Can't no Kaffir make fun of me no more. I ain't no flying nun, you know. Can't no crazy Muslim compare me to a nun either. I'm a Muslim. A nun wish she could have been me. 
The nuns are down there burning in the fire. Don't you ever say a Muslim woman looks like a nun. They wish they could be as beautiful as us. You ever seen a nun look like Layla? Hello, I put them to shame. And that's my game, to shame. Hello. So the people will great glorify and praise Allah out of enjoyment and pleasure. So how can some man tell y'all like it's a big accomplishment? You ain't got to pray no more. Dude, you got some issues. Okay. Also, after Allah tells us that we will no longer have to prove ourselves to him, what will Allah do? After Allah makes that announcement that no longer do we have to prove ourselves to him, guess what he will do? He will reveal his faith to us. We will finally get to see our Lord who helped us through this world. Our Lord who gave us the strength to overcome. As Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, some faces on that day will be shining and radiant when they look at their Lord. Why did he say some? The companions of the prophet explained that too. The unbelievers will never see the face of Allah. The people of the hellfire will never, ever, ever see Allah's face. Why? Because seeing Allah's face is the greatest thing of all. And Allah will only reveal his appearance to the people of paradise. So, and where's my Dalil? Here it is. Allah says, in the interpretation of the meaning, the unbelievers will be denied that great joy and honor of seeing their Lord's face. Surely the evildoers will be screened or veiled from seeing that Lord their day. That's right there in the Quran, guys. Believe it or not, you got a bunch of un- educated Muslims arguing about whether or not the Kafir will see Allah's face. When Allah tells us in the Quran that they won't, why would he reveal himself, which is the greatest honor of all to a Kafir? Also, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when the people of paradise enter paradise, Allah will ask them, is there anything else you want? They will say, haven't you uh, given us light and honored us enough? Haven't you not admitted us here and saved us from the fire? What else could we want? And that's when Allah will lift the veil from his face. And they will have never been given anything greater than to look at their Lord. That hadith is, is from Muslim and Bukhari. So the believers, after we enter into our gardens on our level, Allah will first of all let us know that there's no more testing. We don't have to prove ourselves to him. And that's going to make us glorify, praise him, and worship him even more. And then he's going to say, guess what? I will now let you see who I am and how I look. And he'll reveal himself. And as the law says in the interpretation of the meaning for those who have done good, this is the best reward to glance at the face of their Lord. Subhanallah, Allah. Can you imagine that, guys? Finally seeing your Lord. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when the people of paradise enter, and the people of hell have entered hell. An angel will say, O oh, people of paradise, Allah made a promise to you that he will fulfill. And the people of paradise will ask, what is the promise? Did he not make our balance weigh heavy and make our faces fill with honor? And did he not admit us to paradise? What else could he do? And then the veil will be lifted and they will see him. And they will never be given anything more precious than to see Allah. 
Also in another hadith, this is all Sahih Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, uh, one of the companions say we were sitting with him and he looked at the moon and he said, you will see your Lord with your own eyes just as you see this moon. And finally, Imam Bukhari tells us that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, surely one of you will meet Allah on the day that you will meet him and there will be no veil or mediator between you. And Allah will say to you, did I not send a messenger to you? And did he not convey the message? And the person will say, yes, my Lord. And then Allah will say, well, have I not given you wealth and abundance? Talking about paradise. And the person will say, yes, Supana Allah, messengers messengers. I'm not talking about the prophets of Allah. There will be no more prophets and messengers of Allah because our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the seal. But Allah will continue to send messengers amongst the people. And here's the dalil again. I am a messenger. Atli is a messenger. Dr. Asim's a messenger. Dramali's a messenger. Kareem Abu Zaid's a messenger. Abu Sam is a messenger. There's a lot of messengers amongst us today. So you can't say that you didn't know the truth. You can't say, here you are a Muslim. You've been Muslim for 50 years and you don't know how to pray. Allah is going to ask you, didn't I send messengers to teach how to pray? What were you doing? Instead of you listening to Jamali, instead of you listening to Atli, instead of you listening to Layla Nasheba, who you couldn't stand, instead of you listening to Sama, instead of you listening to Kareem Abu Zayd, what were you doing? You were listening to the, the Amina Wadud's. You were listening to the innovators. You were listening to the devi de deviators. You were listening to the people of deception because you did not want to hear the truth. So we can't say, none of you living on this planet today, no Muslim on this planet today can say that he or she did not receive the message because there are many messengers amongst us. I just named a few, there's others. There's many messengers amongst us. The question is, are you listening to them? The question is, are you taking heed from them? Or are you squambling your time with the Ruwaybida? The Ruwaybida. Who are the Ruwaybida? The prophet said they are the despicable ones who will have a lot to say about everything. They'll have a lot to say about politics. They'll talk about the psychology of marriage. They'll talk about the psychology of raising children. They'll try to use science to justify Islam. But if you were to ask them, what are the sunnins of the prayer? They can't tell you. If you were to ask them, can a woman lead a man in prayer? They don't know. If you were to ask them, will the Kaffirs see a law on a day of judgment? They can't answer. But unfortunately, those are the people we're listening to. The Ru We Bida. We don't want to hear the Layla Nashibas. She's too loud. We don't want to hear the Usamas. He's too loud. He's too grassroots. We don't want to hear the Kareem Abu Zaids. He don't tell me that he don't give me the answers to questions I want to hear. We don't want to listen to Jamali. He fumbles. Keep on listening to those sweet speaking, beer trimming men and women that y'all listen to today. Arched eyebrowed women that y'all listen to today. All right. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. 
Inshallah, tomorrow, what I'm going to do is speak more about the people of paradise. I'm going to get back into the marriages again. Today, I had to change to this because unfortunately, you know, like I said, I get these emails from these Nasi high seekers, uh, you know, and I have to settle the score with them. And like I say, read my PowerPoints because I use PowerPoint for a reason. The PowerPoint is my Dalil. I'm going to put the Hadiths and the Quranic verses there. And if it's coming from Ibn Abbas or Abu Huraira or a companion, I'm going to put it there. Read it. Maybe you don't want to read it because it's not Sheikh come a dime a dozen. You don't want to read it because it ain't Mufti so-and-so. It ain't Imam so-and-so who y'all follow today. I don't know. Get it together, people. All right, so I'm going to stop right here. Supana kalahuma wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha ila anta, astakfiruka wa tubu ila.